Part five, section two, chapter twenty eight of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty eight, Christian Literature. Elementary religious works were produced at an early period. The New England Primer, during the eighteenth century, was the little manual which was regarded in New England as necessary for every child's instruction. The catechism prepared by Richard Mather and John Cotton, entitled Spiritual Milk for Babes, appeared in many forms and for many years, and was incorporated into the New England primer of later date. It was made a part of a primer for the colony of Connecticut, and published about 1715. The New England primer absorbed the necessary parts of other elementary works, and was published in the various colonies it was edited by many competent hands and adapted itself to the political changes of the colonies at one time it was strongly anti-catholic it was loyal to the british king when it was necessary so to be but in due time it produced washington's portrait as its frontispiece the new england primer improved was the later and final form it contained hymns by watts easy spelling and reading lessons prayers acrostics the shorter catechism and the celebrated dialogue between christ youth and the devil the picture of john rogers at the stake surrounded by his wife and children was always a necessary illustration the alphabetic couplets beginning with in adam's fall we sinned all and closing with zacchaeus he did climb the tree his lord to see were never omitted as needful exposition of the truth to accompany the quaint illustrations the psalterium americanum edited by cotton mather was used for worship extensively the whole book of psalms published in 1640 and the first english book printed in the western hemisphere was a literal reprint of the received version it was as near an approach to the psalter of the established church as the antipathies of the puritan fathers would allow the great basis of the new england faith was the westminster catechism it was the universal guide each pastor in the colonial period proceeded according to its requirements it was regarded as the great modern triumph of christianity in europe sermons were preached upon it and books were published in exposition of it samuel willard for example covered a space of nineteen years by delivering two hundred and fifty lectures on the shorter catechism his works were published after his death in a ponderous volume the first folio produced by the american press sermons were a favorite form of religious literature watts's psalms and hymns went through numerous editions religious biography such as the journal of whitefield and others was in general demand reprints of baxter's practical works were common only a short time elapsed before a good practical work in england found its way to boston and came out from the press of neeland bumstead or some other printer of that place the fruits of the colonial press now appear exceedingly primitive but they formed an essential part of the religious foundation of the country and proved to us the early determination of the colonists to develop a religious literature independent of the mother country the religious literature of the recent period has taken on a more popular character to no one writer is america indebted more than to jacob abbott for the power of religion over the popular mind after leaving the elliott congregational church in roxbury massachusetts in eighteen thirty six of which he was pastor for two years he devoted his whole time to the writing of religious books these have had an enormous sale he made religion attractive and inaugurated a new era in the treatment of such themes as soon as the sunday school began to use the circulating library a demand arose for a literature that would combine fascinating interest with pure moral instruction this demand has been abundantly supplied in a sunday school literature the most captivating in the world 
writers like Daniel Wise, Edward Everett Hale, Richard Newton, Mrs. A. D. T. Whitney, Julia A. Eastman, and Pansy, Mrs. G. R. Alden, have furnished the present generation with religious books of unparalleled interest and power. Some of the works of Newton have been translated into twenty languages. The most recent phase of this subject is the popularity of books of scholarly and thoughtful caste. Volumes of sermons and other discussions in religion by vigorous and progressive thinkers, who are heartily in sympathy with historic Christianity, pass through many editions in a few years. The best preachers command a vast audience through their books and the weekly publication of their sermons. Religious newspapers and magazines have a wide circulation, which is constantly increasing. Judging from the sale of books, there never was so much popular interest in religion as at present. In no country has the religious press so prominent a place as in the United States, and that place is richly deserved by superior merit. Thomas Prince, 1722-48, to son of the famous pastor of the Old South Church, published the first American periodical. It was called The Christian History, containing accounts of the revival and propagation of religion in Great Britain and America for 1743, Boston, 1744 to 45, two volumes. It was published weekly. The Connecticut Evangelical Magazine began in 1800 in Hartford and continued ten years. The Massachusetts Missionary Magazine began in Boston in 1803. The Panoplist, begun in 1805, was merged into it in 1808. The name was changed to that of Missionary Herald in 1822, and under that familiar name the magazine has continued to the present time. Other religious and theological magazines and quarterlies followed. The first of the present religious newspapers was the Congregationalist, which began under the title of the Boston Recorder, January 3, 1816. The next in order of time were the Religious Intelligencer in 1816, the Watchman in 1819, the Christian Mirror in 1822, Zion's Herald in 1823, New York Observer in 1823, the Christian Advocate in 1826, the Morning Star in 1826. Many other great denominational papers followed in quick succession. In the Chautauqua Literary and Scientific Circle, the reading habit has found one of its most stimulating incitements. This movement originated in an assembly held at Chautauqua Lake, New York, in 1874. It has rapidly developed into an annual institution, and continues its immense influence through the year by a reading course. The varied courses of studies, lectures, and readings have been enjoyed by thousands every year, and the number visiting Chautauqua for these purposes is rapidly multiplying. Such work has brought new life and light to many homes, and by the communion of delightful studies has brightened the dull routine of daily toil. Bishop John H. Vincent and the Honorable Lewis Miller were the originators of the Chautauqua movement. President Harper of the University of Chicago is the principal of its varied schools. From the day of the Bay Psalm Book and Wigglesworth's Day of Doom to the verse of Ray Palmer is a history fraught with notable achievements in Christian song. America has contributed her share to the general chorus. The more notable of our hymn writers have been recognized by the whole Christian world. Timothy Dwight, died 1817, the president of Yale College, was a renowned theologian in his time, but he is now known most of all for his hymn, which is sung the world over, I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord. Samuel Davies, died 1761, one of the most eloquent and powerful preachers of the American church, wrote, Lord, I am thine, entirely thine. James Waddell Alexander, died 1859, 
of princely origin was happy in his translation of german hymns the old passion hymn o sacred head now wounded is the best known bishop george w doane died eighteen fifty nine wrote softly now the light of day his brethren in the episcopal church bishop henry w onderdonk and william augustus muhlenberg have also produced some masterpieces the latter who died in eighteen seventy seven was a man of saintly life and of noble influence on the christian life and thought of his time his hymns like noah's weary dove and i would not live alway will long continue to express the sentiments of innumerable souls until the discords of earth are lost in the harmonies of the song of moses and the lamb the poet bryant is known by several hymns found in all the hymnals and john pierpont has given us o thou to whom in ancient times and the winds are hushed the peaceful moon phoebe carey wrote many sweet lyrics of trust and hope her best-known hymn is one sweetly solemn thought william b tappan died eighteen forty nine was an industrious poet his there is an hour of peaceful rest and tis midnight and on olive's brow are familiar to christians in all parts of the world augustus l hillhouse died eighteen fifty nine wrote one of the grandest poems in the english language trembling before thine awful throne edward h sears author of one of the best studies of john's gospel the fourth gospel the heart of christ gave us two inspiring christmas hymns calm on the listening ear of night and it came upon the midnight clear bishop arthur cleveland cox is the author of oh where are kings and empires now how beauteous are the marks divine and in the silent midnight watches ray palmer died eighteen eighty seven stands at the head of all our american hymn writers and by the side of the immortal masters of universal christian song some of his hymns are perfect like the best of wesley's and watts and top ladies they seem the fruit of a divine inspiration they are exquisite in form and breathe the majestic spirit of christian faith and the profound humility of christian devotion all of our great poets have contributed to our hymnology longfellow whittier bryant holmes have written single lyrics which greatly enrich the sacred poetry of the church universal End of chapter twenty eight